Um, I would like to begin uh, by thanking uh, the organizers, and in particular Pierre and Mazia, for giving me the opportunity to present at this conference a recent experiment uh, done at Yale. Uh, this experiment was actually the thesis project of uh, Zlaku Mineyev, who is in the audience. And uh, I have to tell you a little story about this. In fact, uh, Zlatko at the summer school uh, learned uh, uh, about uh, an experimental proposal from Howard Carmichael, uh, a quantum optics uh, uh, proposal. And uh, Zlatko came back to Yale uh, uh, very uh, passionate about uh, this proposal and we discussed it and at first I have to admit that uh, I was very skeptical. Uh, first of all this proposal didn't seem very original to me. It seemed to me that uh, the experiment more or less had been done and uh, second the experiment was extremely difficult. Uh, so as a, for a thesis project this uh, didn't sound uh, uh, adequate. But uh, we had uh, a long uh, conversation with um, Zlatko, which uh, carried on to uh, numerical experiments and so on. This uh, took uh, several weeks. And then at uh, the end, I became very convinced that this was a, a very fine project and, and um, a very interesting experiment, as I hope to, to convince you. So this is a message for the graduate students in the audience. Uh, if you uh, go to your advisor with a pro an experimental project and your advisor is skeptical or even against it, well, uh, be persistent. Uh, uh, you, have to, <laughs> you have to insist. Yeah, persistence is uh, the first quality of an experimentalist. Okay, so uh, let me uh, introduce um, the team that uh, um, I did this experiment. Uh, this is uh, Zlatko, but uh, we have uh, also benefited from uh, the help of Mazia in this experiment. Uh, I want also to mention that uh, uh, Stephen uh, and Clark uh, um, are actually in the audience and are presenting uh, posters on, on different experiments done in the lab uh, during this conference. So, uh, Howard, uh, is here. Uh, we are benefiting also from a, a longer um, uh, time collaboration with Rob Sholkoff and in particular with this student uh, Philip Reinhold who was a great help uh, in devising uh, um, the program uh, for the fast electronics. Okay, so this is the outline of the talk. Uh, I will, uh, there are two parts. Uh, in the first part, I will uh, tell you about uh, this uh, proposal, this experimental proposal, which at the uh, origin was a, a quantum optics proposal. And then uh, I will uh, move on and explain how the experiment is done in, uh, in a quantum circuit platform, artificial uh, superconducting atom. And we, uh, we ha hold some pride in the fact that um, this experiment is probably close to impossible in a quantum optics setting, but you know can be done uh, naturally uh, with uh, optical, uh, with artificial superconducting atoms, we um, we want to be not always uh, uh, quantum optics wannabes, but uh, uh, you know do experiments that uh, are um, not possible with a natural atom. Okay, so uh, let me remind you uh, um, or explain uh, for uh, the more junior members of the audience uh, the principle of uh, the original observation of quantum jumps, which uh, was a key experiment uh, done on a single uh, atom. Um, the idea is to monitor uh, whether you are in the uh, ground or dark uh, state of an atom. This uh, excited state is called dark because it's uh, not coupled or very weakly coupled to the radiation field. And uh, this uh, three-level atom uh, has uh, what is called the V-level con configuration uh, because this transition here from D to uh, this uh, state, uh, ancillary state bright, is uh, uh, strongly forbidden. 
Um, this, uh, as you will see, this bright state uh, serves as uh, an ancillary state for the readout of this uh, two-level manifold. Um, so this is the principle of the experiment. You want to uh, drive uh, this uh, transition, very weak transition, with uh, a laser, very strong laser, but the transition is very weak. And you want to detect uh, uh, whether the atom is in the ground or the dark state. Basically, uh, uh, whether you have been successful in rubby flopping uh, the, the atom. And what you do is uh, that you have a second laser which drives this uh, transition, a uh, strong transition uh, between the ground and the bright state. And this bright state returns uh, to the, the, the system in the bright state returns to the ground state by emitting a fluorescent photon, which you collect with the photodetector. This constitutes a cycling transition, which is uh, um, uh, very fast. Uh, in fact, uh, there's an important hierarchy of scales in this experiment. So this, uh, drive it, uh, uh, this rapid drive between uh, the ground and the dark state is the lowest uh, frequency of the problem. Next, uh, you have uh, this much stronger rapid drive here. And then uh, you have uh, a fluorescence decay rate, which is even faster. So essentially, um, when the system is in uh, B, it uh, falls very quickly to G. So the detection of um, uh, this uh, DG manifold uh, is uh, an indirect uh, QND measurement. It is based on some kind of counterfactual reasoning. So if you don't see the fluorescence of the bright state, it means that um, the atom uh, cannot uh, be long, no longer be in G, because if it would be in G, it would be uh, driven uh, very strongly by this uh, drive to be and it would fluoresce. Instead, uh, the atom must be uh, somewhere else uh, and in, evidently in that uh, state uh, dark. So it's a bit like uh, parents uh, who are waiting uh, for their teenage uh, daughter or, or, or son uh, for dinner and um, their child doesn't come uh, home for dinner, so the, the reasoning is that the, um, they, they must be partying somewhere else. So that's the kind of uh, reasoning that is used uh, in this experiment. Okay, so um, these are um, uh, more uh, details on the original observation of quantum jump. Um, the problem um, in this kind of experiment is that the collection efficiency of uh, the fluorescence photon is usually very, uh, very small. In the original experiment, uh, close to 0.1%. Uh, uh, um, but um, because uh, this rate is very fast, you can still detect enough photon to get uh, this uh, measurement record. So if you plot uh, the, uh, the, the detection uh, current, uh, the detector current as a function of time, you will see uh, this uh, series, this continuous signal, which has basically uh, two plateaus. A plateau with um, strong fluorescence and a plateau with essentially only the, the dark current. And you can pass um, a line uh, between these two plateaus and that defines a threshold and uh, the jumps are defined uh, uh, by the crossing of the threshold. And, uh, uh, you can identify uh, two, uh, um, two uh, types of, uh, of uh, states here. Um, when you see uh, fluorescence here, you, um, you are in this uh, uh, GB uh, manifold here. You're cycling uh, the transition between uh, G and B. But uh, when you don't see any uh, fluorescence, then you must, be, uh, you must have jumped to a D state. And uh, this brings me to a very important notion. Uh, we have to agree on this. So uh, for driven uh, uh, a quantum system that is monitored, and monitored uh, with a very strong rate, uh, uh, um, the measurement rate in that context is uh, much stronger than the transition rate, then uh, uh, for this monitored variable here, 
the signal will look like uh, a series of plateaux due to uh, the quantum Zeno effect. And uh, there will be uh, abrupt fronts uh, um, between these plateaus. The signal is perfectly continuous, but uh, there are these uh, strong uh, uh, fronts here. So if you are, your signal to noise ratio is good enough, if um, the fluctuations around the plateau are small enough, you will be able to pass uh, thresholds between the plateaus and then uh, you will declare that a jump uh, has happened when you cross um, uh, this threshold. So this is an important notion because uh, the jump in a way is defined uh, by the operator, by the observer. The signal is, uh, of course, the, the raw signal coming from the experiment is always uh, continuous. Okay, um, so um, this original uh, um, observation of quantum jumps in atomic physics uh, was followed by uh, many other such experiments in other systems. So they are uh, observed not only uh, for atoms but also for uh, photons themselves. Uh, this is the celebrated uh, Arroche and Raymond experiment on uh, quantum jumps of light. They have been uh, seen uh, uh, in superconducting uh, qubit circuits and uh, more recently in uh, NV centers and even in uh, uh, NREF uh, uh, levels in uh, atomic point contacts in SACLE. So these uh, quantum jumps are uh, very general in quantum physics. But here, in our experiment, we want to uh, address the following question. So the quantum jumps are reputed to be essentially uh, completely random. They are unpredictable in the long term. But um, the question is that, is there some kind of advance warning signal that will tell us whether a quantum jump is about to occur or not? The situation is a bit uh, like uh, what happens with tsunamis. You know that uh, tsunamis are due to earthquakes on the seabed floor and uh, because uh, sound uh, travels much faster in rock uh, than on the surface of water, you have uh, uh, this earthquake signal which can uh, be detected because before the, the wave front of the tsunami arrives, which, leaves, uh, which gives some uh, possible uh, uh, warning to the population to go on high ground. So this is basically the question we are asking uh, to quantum jump. In a, in a, uh, in a too simple system, in a two-level atom, this is not possible. But if you enlarge uh, the Hilbert space to at least three levels, this question has an answer. And um, it, this, um, now this leads me to the proposal of uh, Howard Carmichael. So Howard imagined that uh, somehow the experiment could be done with uh, um, a full quantum efficiency, a fully efficient uh, a measurement of the fluorescence photon. So, um, so this is, uh, of course, uh, highly hypothetical at this point, but let's, uh, let's go on. You um, add uh, another constraint, which is that uh, the bandwidth of the detection of the photon is even uh, shorter than uh, all the time scales. So you have a very good, uh, very close monitoring of the fluorescence, uh, which is going to be very well time resolved compared with the other uh, uh, frequencies or times in the system. And what will you observe? Well, you observe a series of clicks, uh, very well resolved clicks, which uh, um, occur in a somewhat uh, a Poisson fashion. And uh, in bit, um, but uh, this series of clicks will be interrupted by this dark period, uh, which you interpret as uh, the system uh, going to the dark state. So uh, remember, the jumps are, are not. Uh, uh, between uh, uh, the individual clicks, uh, the jump are in between uh, the uh, series of uh, Poisson distributed click and this uh, large lull period where you uh, see no clicks. And so, what do you uh, what do you predict uh, when it comes from the to the transition between uh, this uh, process and uh, this lull here? Well. Um, 
Obviously, the system cannot uh, go instantaneously from the ground state to the dark state. So what exactly happens after the last click? So we're going to uh, zoom in uh, um, in, this, uh, in this period, right after the last fluorescence click. And uh, let's suppose we have this uh, measurement record and uh, we have this identified this last click here. So the population um, of the various states can be computed from uh, uh, quantum trajectories uh, for Melism, and this is fairly simple here. So you're most of the time in the ground state because the fluorescence from B to the, the, the G is very fast. So you have a little bit of population in the bright state and you have absolutely no population in the dark state. But uh, if you continue the integration of the equation, the inferred population of the dark and the ground state uh, basically cross each other and there is this middle point here which you uh, can define as the moment where the jump occurs. There's a continuous flight uh, uh, of the system from G to D, but you see this is a, an abrupt front. What is absolutely remarkable is because the detection from there on here uh, detects a null event, so this is the, the story, uh, the Sherlock Holmes story of the dog that doesn't bark in the night. Um, well, um, because uh, you detect uh, null events, this trajectory is deterministic. It's not noisy at all. Um, so from shot to shot, um, the system should pass exactly through this uh, trajectory. That's, that's uh, an interesting uh, observation. Then the second uh, very interesting observation is that this midpoint can be computed. This is the, the formula. It's rather simple. The prefactor here is uh, linked to the average distance here between the average time between the clicks, it's of the order. But there is a, a supplementary factor, a log factor, that enhances uh, this time. So it is, uh, can be quite long um, compared with the average time uh, between clicks here. So you can really separate the moment where the jump occurs to um, these um, um, uh, more rapid events uh, between uh, fluorescence clicks. And uh, then uh, there is uh, the third prediction, which is absolutely unbelievable at first, uh, which is that, uh, in fact, uh, this middle point is a coherent state, a coherent superposition between G and D. So this uh, sounds very paradoxical at first, because this is not an isolated system. This is a system under constant monitoring. It's coupled to an environment, and it is measured extremely fast by the environment. Yet, uh, there is an island of uh, determinism and, and coherence uh, in, uh, in this long series of uh, noise. Uh, why uh, do you have um, a pure state? Well, um, we, have, um, we have this uh, condition of uh, the observer being fully efficient. So all, all uh, information leaving uh, the system is collected. So under this condition, the system remains completely pure. It may wander, uh, it may wobble around, but uh, you know the wobble because you m measure the system at all times. So there's no, no contradiction. It's, uh, it's a bit shocking at first uh, when you hear it for the first time, but that's what uh, a modern quantum measurement theory predicts. Okay, so that's so far so good. Um, what is the problem? Why haven't uh, every, any, you know, anyone in quantum optics done this experiment already? This sounds like a very elementary experiment on, on quantum measurements. Well, the difficulty is that you should not miss a single click. Why? because uh, the width of the front is itself uh, uh, given by the distance between click. And so if you miss uh, that last click, well, there is a, a temporal fuzz, uh, there's a jitter in your data which completely wash out, washes out uh, this coherence. Okay, so, um, well, this didn't discourage uh, Zlatko. Uh, um, 
the experiment uh, we have performed uh, is not the first experiment on quantum jumps in superconducting circuits. There's, there's a whole <laughs> literature on that question. But uh, all these experiments, all these previous experiments, were always on two levels, uh, an atom with only two levels. Um, two level is too, too simple, too restricted to uh, be in this uh, position of being able to predict uh, a quantum jump, to get this advanced warning. The, the Hilbert space is not big enough. So, um, let me uh, <coughs> remind you or, or uh, um, explain uh, uh, what uh, this, uh, our circuit uh, QED implementation is. Uh, uh, we have an artificial atom uh, in a superconducting cavity. In this, uh, it's, uh, this atom is going to be based on the transmon uh, artificial atom whose micrograph is uh, uh, shown here. And uh, we have uh, this very simple Hamiltonian. We have uh, a cavity uh, here. We have uh, a, a qubit, an artificial atom, which you can think of as a, a nonlinear resonator with unequally spaced uh, levels. And then uh, there is a photon-photon coupling uh, between the atom and uh, the cavity. So this is the standard uh, dispersive regime of uh, circuit quantum electrodynamics. Here we are going to build a, a three-level atom. We need to build a V, uh, a v uh, system. And we do this by combining uh, very closely two transmons. One transmon is oriented parallel to the cavity field and will produce essentially this uh, bright transition here. And uh, the other transmon uh, is placed horizontally, so it's completely decoupled from the cavity field. Hence, uh, this uh, dark uh, transition here. Of course, when you implement uh, this circuit uh, in a cavity, uh, when you put this kind of chip in a cavity, you will get uh, four levels, but um, the various uh, shifts here um, can uh, um, actually suppress uh, the, as far as the spectroscopy is uh, going this uh, fourth level or if you want it is sufficiently outside uh, your, the band of interrogation that you can forget about it. So we, we can focus on the uh, three uh, first level of uh, this combination, this molecule, this transmond molecule. Okay. So, uh, this is the a more complete view of uh, the experiment. What is uh, absolutely essential in this experiment is that there is a fast electronic system that provides feedback um, in the following manner. So, we, uh, we have a readout signal in blue here, which probes, uh, uh, which sends a signal in the cavity, and the, the information is collected back uh, in uh, this, um, sorry, I'm going to, this, um, somehow the battery uh, failed. So the signal coming back uh, is analyzed uh, through an amplification uh, chain here and sent uh, to this uh, uh, fast electronic board uh, that uh, reacts in real time and send, uh, is able to uh, send uh, signal back uh, on the qubit. So you can uh, measure very fast uh, the qubit uh, or the, this three-level atom uh, uh, more precisely and um, react back um, on the system. And this is going to be essential because uh, we are going to observe uh, this series of clicks and at some point when we decide that the jump uh, is in flight uh, we have to interrupt the system uh, uh, shut off all the drives and do tomography on the system. Uh, for the specialist in the audience, uh, the, uh, these are the various uh, scales, uh, the various time scales employed in the circuit. Um, the, what is important is that uh, we have a state of the art uh, coherence time for this um, uh, dark transition, which is uh, in excess of 100 microseconds. And this uh, provides uh, enough dynamical range to fit uh, all the time scales of the experiment, as I'm going to discuss uh, right now. So, 
how did we get to measure uh, the equivalent of uh, basically every photon in the quantum optics implementation? It would be very hard to uh, collect uh, all the photons, but in uh, this quantum circuit, uh, the photons travel along transmission line. So this is a 1D system, so there's not, uh, you, there's not this penalization of uh, the fluorescence photon being sent in uh, four pi. So that's uh, one of the gain. But um, uh, essential to the experiment was also to have uh, included another ancilla stage. You see, I, I have reversed uh, the diagram here. Now the dark uh, to ground uh, transition is on the left. Uh, the first uh, ancilla system is this uh, B level, which we use uh, for this indirect uh, QND transition and the observation of this manifold, but we have intercalated uh, um, a, uh, a second ancilla, which is this uh, cavity mode, uh, which is here represented as an LC oscillator whose uh, hell varies uh, depending on whether the system is in the bright uh, state or in the dark state. And this is shown uh, uh, here in this uh, cavity response uh, Lorentzian. So you see if you are in the uh, bright state, the cavity will resonate at this frequency, but if uh, the atom is e either in the dark or ground state, with the, you know, there's a slight overlap, but essentially you will get essentially no response uh, from this circuit. <coughs> so by uh, uh, this is the protocol. You uh, shine a light in the cavity at this frequency and uh, basically you will observe um, a, a change uh, in the response uh, um, basically due to this uh, big um, uh, frequency pool between these two states which are essentially indistinguishable in the experiment and uh, the bright state. <coughs> So there is a multiplication effect here. So what would be the um, uh, one photon detected out of bright state uh, becomes actually uh, essentially seven photons because you can populate uh, this uh, resonator with the word uh, seven photons. So that's a stage of amplification which allows us to essentially uh, monitor the uh, bright state uh, as if we would be able to detect uh, basically all photons. In effect, uh, we have an effective efficiency when uh, you, co you, you take into account all the, uh, the um, various um, gains and noise in the amplification chain. We have the equivalent of a 90% uh, collection efficiency in the uh, equivalent fluorescence detection. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the raw response uh, from the so we bounce uh, this, um, um, uh, this light uh, uh, from the cavity. Uh, this is microwave light. It is analyzed both uh, in, uh, in phase and in quadrature. You see that uh, the reflected amplitude carries uh, essentially uh, um, information in the I quadrature. Um, the scale here, um, square root of seven, means that uh, when uh, the, you are in the bright state, uh, the, the, ca the cavity is populated with on average seven photons. And here, uh, when the system is either in the G or, or, B or D state, you have essentially zero photon in the cavity. There's a little bit of information in the Q quadrature also. Um, so, um, you can uh, actually uh, assign uh, right away um, these uh, uh, periods, these different uh, periods to the data. Uh, it's quite obvious from uh, this example. And this is uh, possible because uh, we can uh, um, apply uh, a filter to this uh, continuous data. And uh, this is uh, what happens in IQ space. So you have essentially two spots uh, corresponding uh, to uh, the B state, uh, that's the response of the B state, and the response of uh, the G and D state are basically located in this uh, area. And by uh, 
uh, setting a, 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 a two-point filter, we can declare in real time uh, uh, what uh, state the system is in. So you, this boundary um, um, serves to declare whether you are in B. And then uh, uh, by setting this threshold here, you can uh, declare that you are in G or D. And if the data falls here, well, you have to take a, a second uh, data point. And uh, with this filter, we can assign uh, to the data um, um, we can uh, um, assign uh, the various states to the data point, to the, the measurement record. And uh, we can, uh, in particular, focus uh, from the transition between B to G. So each time you have a transition from B to G, which is the equivalent of a, a fluorescence event uh, in the original experiment, we say we have a click. So this, uh, these arrows correspond to transitions between uh, B and uh, G. And you see that exactly like uh, in the theoretical proposal, we indeed have uh, in, the data, in the data uh, a sequence, a uh, Poissonian looking sequence of clicks here, uh, interrupted uh, by uh, a large, a long period. And uh, during this uh, long period, uh, we can be uh, yeah, yeah, in the mid uh, uh, here. If we wait uh, a long enough time uh, after the last click, we can say for sure that the system is in D. But the question now is uh, what happens uh, in this transition period? So this is where this uh, feedback circuit is going to enter. We are going to um, uh, wait uh, for um, some time here uh, when we see no clicks and then we are going to uh, do a tomography, we are going to stop uh, the drives and see what uh, the system is in, uh, in what, uh, what state is the system. Um, I want to mention that uh, there are two, uh, uh, um, you know, two separated time scales here the time scale uh, where you have this interruption of clicks and then uh, the time uh, in between clicks. And uh, there is a clear separation between these two time scales um, for in the interest of time I won't uh, go into this detail if you are interested uh, uh, in uh, how this uh, separation can be done. I'll, um, um, I, can, uh, I can talk about this uh, in the question period. So. Uh, how are we going to catch the jump? So uh, there's uh, this fast electronics uh, which uh, integrates uh, the signal. So the smallest um, scale uh, here, the fastest uh, time is um, the measurement rate, which is a few nanoseconds. And then uh, at the other um, uh, opposite, uh, uh, in the, towards a long time, we have uh, the time uh, it takes uh, for the drive uh, between G and D uh, if there was no observation to uh, go to the uh, uh, the um, um, to the D state to the um, uh, the D state and um, here the time of the jump uh, the the mid flight time uh, happens uh, uh, um, in an intermediate time scale, which has to be separated from the others <coughs> by uh, enough um, um, uh, with a comfortable ratio, otherwise uh, your this uh, mid-flight time will be hidden uh, uh, within the other phenomena. And uh, as you will see, the um, so even though we have a measurement rate, we have a very close monitoring of the system, so a few nanoseconds, the, um, the jump, uh, the mid uh, point of the jump is going to happen after a few microseconds. So you have enough orders of magnitude, you have a very, very fast monitoring uh, compared uh, with uh, this uh, time of uh, the jump. So we'll, uh, we can uh, plot um, the result of the tomography as a function of the, what we call the catch time, which is the time elapsed uh, after the last uh, jump. So this data is conditioned on observing uh, no more uh, clicks. 
And if you want um, these data points here, uh, even though you see that uh, the signal to noise ratio is excellent, um, this is uh, done with fewer and fewer events uh, as the time elapses here, because there will be uh, less and less events. But because we catch many, many events here, we can still have an excellent uh, resolution uh, for the data point. And you see that um, these data points match uh, theory very uh, closely. There's a, there's a miss here uh, due to various uh, imperfections of the experiment. We don't, um, we don't go exactly to one, and I'll come back uh, on this point. What is very interesting is that we can measure not only the Z component of this manifold, the Z component is basically the probability of being either in the ground state, which corresponds to minus one, or the uh, uh, D state, which corresponds to one. You can measure the coherence, you can measure uh, X, which is the, the amplitude of being in this superposition of, uh, of uh, G and D. And you see that uh, you have a rise of uh, this coherence, and it more or less uh, goes to a maximum when we go to the midpoint of the jump. Um, on the other hand, uh, we have nothing in the Y uh, component. So this is, uh, this is uh, fairly good. Uh, we uh, event, uh, we uh, indeed see that uh, the jump uh, is uh, continuous and deterministic. Uh, and uh, in the middle, we have a maximum of coherence. We have a superposition of, of state. Um, however, you might ask the question, well, what determines this coherence? Uh, what is, uh, um, well, coherence with respect to what first? The coherence, uh, uh, the uh, axis of reference uh, for X uh, is synchronized uh, with this drive. So you could say, well, you know, yes, uh, you have a superposition of state, but after all, you still have a drive in the background. It's a very weak drive, by the way. Uh, if you would observe uh, the system uh, under this drive alone, um, then you would see an arc of sine uh, which would be extremely long. It would, its maximum will be out uh, you know, in the yard uh, out there. Um, in the experiment, uh, it's about uh, something like. Um, um, uh, correct me, Slatko, but it would be 500 nanoseconds, uh, something like that. So on this, uh, sorry, um, no, no, um, I get this wrong. No, uh, 500 uh, microseconds. So it's much, uh, it's much longer than uh, uh, this uh, uh, front here, which, by the way, is given by a tanch function. So the the evolution of the system under observation has nothing to do with the uh, uh, normal uh, Rabi evolution. Um, it is um, actually governed by a totally different uh, function, which is uh, much faster. But um, yes, so what determines this uh, coherence? Uh, there is um, this um, midpoint here. Um, we, we have uh, this superposition of state uh, and um, um, we need to, to do complementary experiment to essentially pinpoint the origin of this coherence. So this is uh, the, uh, a more advanced protocol. So we have um, three types of signal in this experiment. Uh, we have uh, this readout uh, uh, tone, which is on all the time. Uh, we have uh, this uh, BG drive, uh, which is also essential to the readout, which is uh, on all the time. But uh, this uh, DG drive here, which uh, produces the jump, we're going to uh, stop it uh, as soon as we don't see any fluorescence photon. Oh, we see no click. So there's going to be some, uh, some time here, but we're going to stop uh, the drive, and we're going to see if the jump uh, still occurs. And uh, these are the results. Uh, and this is uh, frankly amazing. Um, I, I, um, um, I would like to pause and tell you that um, when we saw this, we were extremely happy. Uh, this is uh, absolutely <coughs> not obvious. 
So you've, um, you've uh, seen, uh, you are conditioning the measurement on seeing no clicks. The system uh, at first uh, has this drive uh, which uh, basically um, takes the block vector and uh, gives it an order to go on, uh, on one uh, great circle, but here you stop at this point. And yet uh, the coherence increases. So after this um, uh, dash line here, there's nothing that drives the system. And yet uh, the jump is completed and uh, is completed in a coherent way. So um, in, in a sense, it is the observation uh, that builds the coherence here. Okay, well, uh, how can uh, we understand this phenomenon uh, simply? Well, uh, remember I said that a system under a close monitoring, if you had a fully efficient monitoring, which is not uh, exactly the case here, hence the, the difference, then uh, the system has to remain pure all the time. So it means that uh, basically z squared plus x squared has to be uh, uh, equal to 1. Of course, it's not cos uh, and sine, uh, which you square, um, which uh, give you 1. It's uh, these shapes, which are respectively tens and uh, uh, sequence, uh, hyperbolic sequence. But uh, in a way, the fact that uh, the flight of the jump passes through 0, so you have no component on Z, uh, requires, uh, since the state has to be pure, that uh, X uh, has to increase. Even though um, there's absolutely uh, nothing except your observation that tells you the system to point along X. If you want, uh, the coherence is due to this initial uh, impulse of the drive at the beginning, which has set uh, the block uh, vector on a course, on, a, on a, uh, a great circle. And once this great circle is chosen, then uh, um, the system uh, proceeds and develops this coherence. You may say, well, uh, energy is not conserved here because uh, you, you observe this system, there's no drive, and yet uh, it goes from uh, the ground to the excited state. But remember, an observed system uh, is uh, profoundly out of equilibrium, so, well, energy doesn't need to, to be conserved. So there's no, there's no contradiction either. Okay, um, can you, in order to, to show that you have indeed a, a coherent system, you can uh, actually uh, reverse the jump. So we, we declare that uh, there is coherence in this system, and so we should be able, uh, because we know exactly when the jump happens and, and what is its phase, we should be able to reverse it. And uh, in fact, it does uh, have work. We have to um, make the protocol a little bit more complicated. So at the end of this sequence, before doing the tomography, we send to the system a pi over two pulse that is going to um, either reverse the jump or actually accompany it, uh, complete it. Uh, and uh, this is done in this experiment where we vary the uh, x-axis, the orientation of um, the field uh, of the pi over 2 pulse along the equator. And so we can uh, either complete, uh, the, the, uh, reverse the jump or go back to the ground state or um, on the contrary, we can uh, actually uh, make the jump uh, to complete uh, very fast. So I see that uh, my time uh, is over. So I will uh, jump to the conclusions here. And, um, and I would like to say uh, several things uh, in this uh, conclusion. So. Um, we, uh, this is really, uh, in our opinion, the first experiment that uh, witnesses the uh, internal coherence of a, a jump, of a quantum system under close monitoring. And this was done because we had uh, this uh, very, very fast electronic. This observation rate is much, much faster than the, um, the, the internal dynamics of the system. 
So with such a close monitoring, you can actually uh, witness this uh, coherence inside the jump. You can uh, use this speed and actually catch the jump and uh, reverse them. Um, I, I didn't go into these details, but uh, the theory that was uh, fitting the data is actually the full uh, quantum trajectory theory, taking into account the inefficiency of, of the measurement. And for instance, there are certain details which are interesting, uh, which I want to point out. Uh, you see, for instance, that the X uh, component here has an overshoot. Uh, you go um, actually beyond zero. And that's because your drive uh, is not uh, uh, sufficiently small compared with your observation. And there is a little bit of overshoot. So when uh, you, uh, you don't go exactly to D, you go a little bit past this. The quantum Zeno effect is not strong enough. And so you have a little bit of inverse component. And you see that, uh, indeed, when the drive is off, uh, this phenomenon is no longer present. You really uh, go uh, to D, and to, you don't have this overshoot. So this is the kind of thing that uh, the, the, the full theory of quantum trajectory predicts. And um, last, I want to say that um, this uh, may seem just uh, a gratuitous interrogation on uh, on the validity of, uh, of uh, trajectory theory. But this uh, catching of quantum jump very efficiently is important in the field of uh, quantum error detection or metrology, where you want to uh, make the experiment of um, detection of the jump as efficient as possible. You don't want to lose any time. As soon as you get some information that the jump is happening, you want to stop and reset the system. So on this uh, note, uh, uh, I want to thank you for your attention.